Over to you, Father Tom. Thank you, Dan. Good to see everybody this evening. This is the first of three, one a month, with a focus on scripture and tonight's title, Dive In. Why study scripture and some suggestions about how to. And I'm sure that each of you already have ways in which you study scripture, if not at this very moment, at times in your life. So I'm not trying to suggest that you all need to be led by the hand which is by way of saying that at any point along the way, if you have an idea, comment, or question, just indicate so to me and I'll, I'll stop so that you can speak. And as Dan said, just remember, you have to unmute yourself when you do speak. I, I'm gonna do kind of a phenomenological approach to this. It's not gonna be heavy on concept. I, and the way I'd, I'd like to begin is to ask you a question. And I know that the, uh, the promo piece and link that went out a few days ago asked you to be thinking about what is a, a favorite scripture passage of yours. We're gonna get to that, that at the end of the program. The question I'd like to ask first this evening, and you can take a moment to think about it, is what is your earliest recollection of a significant interaction with scripture. Something that maybe uh, has stuck with you all this time to this day. What's your earliest rec recollection of a significant interaction with scripture? And it could be anything. It's just that it's, it's something that happened a long time ago and it stays with you. I am as soon as anybody has something to say on that, just uh, indicate that you're going to come off mute and share that. Well, I got an easy one to get it started. When I went to Catholic school, I think it was in second grade, we had a, uh, a little Christmas pageant in the class. I don't know what class it was. And there was a kid in the class by the name of Fran LaFaro, who he was second grade and he was Italian. He had very dark skin. And he got to be one of the wise men. And I realized the first time I just all of a sudden the whole concept of the visit of the wise men took on new meaning when I saw it performed. And um, also to this day on Facebook, when I wish him a happy birthday, you know, he's well into his 60s now, mid 60s, I say happy birthday to my favorite wise man. So that that's something that definitely sticks out, right? And it stays with you over time. Others on an early interaction, a significant interaction with scripture. And I can give one to keep the ball moving. I, I could do one. To okay, keep Herb. Um, you know, I grew up with more of a rolling, roiling family of seven kids. So, um, there was always interaction within the family. Um, and my mother was always the um, peacemaker. And um, uh, she, she, in her own way, uh, was brought up in uh, the, really what was the Catholic tradition. But she would always emphasize the golden rule of doing on to others and um, holding back and restraint and uh, keeping at ease your impulses not to retaliate in any way. And I think um, uh, she made it so that uh, to this day, all of the brothers and sisters all kind of uh, meld together. And there isn't that kind of fractious relationship between any. So I would attribute it to, that to her um, emphasis on um, those traditions. And then setting us off to catechism and everything yeah. else. With that. In the trenches, <laughs> a significant interaction in the trenches. Kathy, thank you. So one of the stories in the Bible that grabbed me was um, when they would go to celebrate um, the Sabbath and walk through the desert for days to get to the temple. And Jesus then neglected to join the crowd to go home. And when Mary and Joseph realized that he was left behind, they had to walk for a very, very long time to find him, only to find him speaking to all the head rabbis 
as already a very wise person. And um, I often wished I could hear what he was saying, but to wow the intellectuals of his time with his own uh, knowledge, I felt was phenomenal. And so I re always remember that. Okay, thank you. Anyone else on an early interaction with scripture? It doesn't have to have a happy ending either. S Susan? Well, this may sound trite, but believe it or not, um, I was raised on MGM movies. We were big movie people. And my mother and her sisters, they all loved all the biblical movies. And I learned more lines from the Bible, probably from Charlton Heston and everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember when I was in Catholic school, when the movie, The King of Kings came out, which is still one of my favorite movies, there was such a blowback because we were in Roman Catholic school and the way they said the Our Father in the movies, the nuns went berserk. Because <laughs> we, you know, Roman Catholic, you stop, you know, um, you don't add um, for thine is the, um, you know, that line oh. at the end that we say until the priest says something first. And uh, I, you know, when I look back now, it was pretty funny, but I, d I did learn, believe it or not, from a lot of the movies, a lot of the lines of scripture, and I still remember them to today. I'm a movie kid. Which is not tried at all. Uh, and what you're all sharing are really, you know, you, you go back into your past and it's something that sticks with you for a reason. Uh, and in the same way that movies for a certain generation would have been the storyteller, other kinds of non-scriptural stories that were retelling of scripture tales would have caught the imagination of children in previous generations too. For me, I, one of my earliest recollections, and I can still feel and see where I was in the church, I, I must have been a preschooler, maybe maybe kindergarten. I, you know, I'd been going to mass every Sunday since I could walk, or at least before that even. But here I was, and all of a sudden, the gospel is about Jesus saying, you know, let the children come to me. And right away, you know, I, I'm like, oh, what's this about? Uh, and there was... It wasn't a big story. It was just that line, let the children come to me. And I was sort of, and I, I'm this little kid thinking, Jesus is telling, you know, don't get in these little kids' way and let them come see me. And that impressed me. And it didn't have a whole lot of regulations. It, it was plain and simple. There were no proviso and no spin of discourse or doctrine, just the simple fact let the children come to me. And that that's stuck in my mind. Well, <clears throat> Sharon. I just want to say, Sue, like you, uh, yes, when you mentioned King of, I'm thinking of Jeffrey Hunter. I mean, I'm such a movie, movie, movie person. I know way too many details. It's really cluttered my brain. All my friends tell me that. Doesn't matter. I learned a lot about, about the Bible and all of that Christian stuff from a lot of movies, most of them pretty good. Yeah. But my first memory when I was very young, um, I don't know how old I was, six or seven, we were reading in Sunday in Bible class about Lot's wife turning to a pillar of salt, it scared me to death. It just was like, holy mackerel, <laughs> this could happen if I'm, if I'm worldly and not you know, into the church. It was it was really scary. So that was my first recollection of anything like that. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, when they talk about books that can be banned, the Bible's probably one of them for some of the scary stories and also the goings on in the Bible. Hi. Uh, anyone else have a have a second significant interaction? I don't want to, you know, stop you short if you wanted to add anything more. Or if, any, if anyone has any comment before I go on, 
one more interaction that I recall was in ninth grade. You know, I, there I was in grade school and I, I'm not doing an anti-Catholic line here, but there was no scripture in my Catholic upbringing. It was all catechism. It was all about do's and don'ts. And it was never about scripture. And as a result, I'd, I'd hear the gospel at the Sunday liturgy, but there wasn't much interaction with scripture itself until and I continued uh, Catholic education, but in high school, it was a totally different environment. It was a very progressive and proactive and engaging college prep program. And that included religion being treated as a college type subject. And I can remember in ninth grade, it was the first semester and we were studying the Old Testament. And my teacher, Sister Virginia, lets out with, after we're reading the creation story, she goes, you know, you do realize there were no TV cameras there recording the event, don't you? Or of any of the interactions with Adam and Eve. And what does that make you realize? And everybody's quiet because you're, no one's had the experience where they're allowed to ask questions or have comments about religion. And she waited and nobody said anything. And she finally said, well, doesn't it make you kind of wonder where did these accounts come from if there's no recording of them? And she said, you know, think about it. it maybe this is just faithful people giving their best shot at saying what it must have been like. And at that moment, like the scales fell from my eyes and I started to take the Bible seriously because Sister Virginia gave me permission to be a realist about the text. And that really was a, was a freeing experience for me. It probably was what set me on a path. But uh, that really sticks out for me. Anyone else or comment from anyone? Just a real quick, like comment. Quick, okay. comment. quickly comment. The gentleman who many of you may, some of you may know, uh, lives on Main Street across from the church, Dr. Berkey, who I believe at one point was the head anesthesiologist at uh, Stony Brook uh, Hospital. And he had a stroke and he's uh, had to retire and stuff. But he and I talk about faith. I've been trying to get him for years to come to All Souls. And he said, oh, I got a slightly different uh, interpretation of God. And Sue and I were driving, doing something at the church. And Dr. Berkey, stroke inhibited as he was, comes running across the street to give me this book. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of it. It's called The Unoriginal Sinner and the Ice Cream God. And it's about this kid growing up Catholic. It's written in 1977 in Chicago. And Father Tom, he lives right near a Methodist church they have a big wall, which is where he learned how to be a baseball player. And one day in the alley, some Methodist kid was coming to church and the church wasn't open. So this Catholic kid decides that this is a good time to convert him to the one true religion, Catholicism. And they get into a discussion about religion and what the true God is. And the Methodist kid is, when he argues with him, keeps quoting scripture. And the author of the book says, I didn't learn scripture at all. All I had was the Baltimore Catechism. <laughs> So it's literally a line directly. It sounded like your, uh, your, your story. Oh, funny. Interesting. Very interesting. One of the reforms of Vatican II, I believe, was we were supposed to read the Bible more. Very true. Now, that your mention of a novel, I, I'm going to mention the novel that also talks about an early interaction with sacred text. The title of the book is The Last of the Just by a French Jewish writer named Andre Schwarzbart. And it is a Holocaust genre novel. And it takes place in France, but that's, that's not the point. The point is there's this rabbi and his wife in the early pages of the novel who are caring for their infant grandson. And the rabbi instructs his wife to bake cakes in the shape of Hebrew letters, and then to brush those cakes with honey so that the child will learn to love Hebrew at an early age. 
and to literally digest the word of God even before the child has the rational capacity so to do. And I found that to be a very compelling image from that novel, which in a way parallels uh, the more didactic paragraph, which is a prayer about scripture, which is in our prayer book, which probably you've all heard and will say, oh, I, I know that one. And here it is. Blessed Lord, who caused all scripture to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Blessed Lord, who caused all Holy Scripture to be written for our learning. All right, essay question. And you can go wherever you want. Is Scripture the Word of God? And you can use that prayer as a frame of reference, if you like. Blessed Lord, who caused all Holy Scripture to be written for our learning. Is Scripture the Word of God? It could be. Could be. I mean, you know, the only gospel I know of that they say is actually the closest thing to what Jesus was actually saying was banned from the Bible, Thomas's gospel. So all of these script stories are interpretations, you know, of what happened from different angles. Just as everything we read is by some author who gives his slant on it. So, you know, how close is anything to what Jesus was actually saying? I would think you have to think in concepts, mm -hmm. not literal. Okay. Thanks, Kathy. I vote yes. Okay. <laughs> well, I do remember the movie. However, when Moses received the Ten Commandments, it was said to be written with the finger of God. And those, those ten um, suggestions ended up in the Bible. So if he wrote that, why wouldn't he have written anything else or encouraged people or, you know, inspired people to write things? Isn't it true that we don't know who wrote the, um, the, the first um, five books of the Bible? Yeah, I mean, it's traditionally attributed to Moses, but right. well, we don't the span know. of time yeah. would make that a little bit hard to do. Yeah, yeah. But it's interesting, Sue, because like you said, God's finger. And Kathy was saying, I, well, it, maybe they're not the exact words of Jesus, but they're coming pretty close based on what people are remembering about it and the impact he had upon them. I, not so that very similar. And what I, what I like about this prayer is that it says, God caused all Holy Scripture to be written for our learning. It doesn't say God wrote it. God caused all Holy Scripture to be written. Now, Except for the Ten Commandments. Hmm? <laughs> Except for well, the Ten Commandments. But God's, God's finger, you know, there's a whole lot of poetry there, right? Maybe First he couldn't find a he, pen. I don't know. Yeah, he, his finger would have to have a he'd have to be a chiseler in order to write it the stone. Uh, but, I can give my uh, spin. Yes, her. And, I, and again, I don't. I here my thought is um, that all of Scripture is written by God, but I say that with the caution 
that never has so much been done in the history of mankind in the word of God to destroy fellow man by saying it is written in scripture. Mm -hmm. And we lose perspective. And again, this is my uh, read is that all of scripture has the finger of God on it in its totality as a way of understanding God and Jesus and the spirit and the Ten Commandments and all of that. But uh, there's a trap there that um, I think many preachers and individuals have taken by saying it is so written and so it has to be. Yeah. without that perspective and um and it's a sad history that's occurred out of that so that's just my thought that, it's she a very good point. more because she's an english teacher and she understands the stuff a lot better <laughs> I mean, isn't that why we i mean one of the draws to go to church for me again after so many years is the sermons to hear what someone who's you know profession and someone who's taken their entire lives and dedicated it to understanding the writings gives us their interpretation, their thoughts on it. You're not, you're just not rereading the passage to us, Father Tom, you're giving us a whole long kind of um, interpretation through your own eyes of what's going on here. And if I start to hear nonsense, which I've heard so many times in churches, it's hard to be dedicated to a church like that. But um, you know, I'm still here because I am listening and saying, okay, maybe, you know, yeah. You know, from um, the last priest we had to you. And um, I don't think two ministers in the entire country have the same exact interpretation. You know, I listened to another one, uh, interpretation on Sundays and it's way different. So these stories seem to be for us to sort out you know, in Thomas's gospel, which I love, and I certainly feel very attuned to it, there's a little piece of it, and then two pages of the scholar discussing it, because we can't begin to understand it. Some of them are clearer than others, but essentially, we need a scholar who can tell us the possible meaning that's there, and maybe they're closer to the meaning, because they do devote their lives to this. That's it. And that's another good point. And it, it's similar to what her was saying in the sense that the whole of scripture has to be taken in its entirety. And when it comes to the interpretation of scripture by people who are dedicating themselves to that pursuit, I, even divergent interpretations need to be heard so that uh, the mixture in some way can open people up to the, the depth of what the meaning might be. And I think that there's intentionality on the part of whoever wrote this prayer originally, because God causing scripture to be written opens up that possibility about all the people who are involved in its coming to be and the experiences that are had that give rise to an understanding of how God is present with us and, and calling us to new places. So God causing people to be open to the presence of the divine and to communicate it. You know, someone might say, well, what's, what's inspiration? And I would say that's a definition of inspiration, people being open to the experience of the divine in their lives and being moved to communicate about it. So that is scripture the word of God? Yes. And are people's words about their experience of God the word of God? Yes. And it's, it's, a, it's a web that just keeps building. It's, it's a network. The spirit's activity is a network. And further on, I'll, I'll say how uh, the study of scripture is, is something individuals can do, but in the end, it's a community act. You, you cannot 
study scripture in isolation as an individual. Just as Kathy said, I, you know, you might depend on someone to interpret scripture, be it in a homily or someone who might be leading Bible study. Those interpretations have to be tested and the truth of them has to unfold. None of it is true just because someone says it is. Uh, and Herb points out how there are just so many examples of how uh, truth has been turned into a weapon that hurts rather than brings people together. So I, this, this pursuit of the study of scripture is one that you at the same time have to be audacious about and humble about. And hearing, reading, marking, learning, and inwardly digesting scripture, whether or not your grandfather instructed your grandmother to honeycoat cakes, I isn't the point per se, but what is, is the extent to which we have to engage scripture and be engaged by scripture and engage each other in trying to understand what it is that is being presented to us about the experience of peoples throughout time. And as I go on here, you know, you take that word worship, you know, as a noun, worship is, is a feeling of reverence and adoration. As a verb, it's the action of reverence and adoration for that which is of supreme importance. Now, the etymology of the word worship in English goes back to an old English word, worth-ship, W-O-R-T-H worth. So giving something worthship was saying, this is of ultimate value. So worship is about focusing upon and acknowledging worthiness. And, you know, very briefly, you know, pe some people have written tomes about this, and I'm going to do it in three simple statements, but cosmos, mythos, ethos. Think of cosmos of, as all that can and does happen under the sun. Think of mythos as the story about that. The story of the human interaction with the divine. The human interaction with that which is of ultimate worth. That which is ultimately worthy. That story then gives shape to an ethos such that it informs and shapes as well as changes and transforms the way we think and act in this life. So that holy word, sacred text are these stories of worth and they are worthy stories for us to consider what throughout time and space people have deemed as guidance and grace for meaning and love in life. So that scripture isn't something that's just dropped into the human situation. Rather, instead of its being you know, imposed from high above, it grows up through the people, through their experiences of what is ultimately valuable in life, their interactions with each other about that, their interactions with ultimate value, with the divine, with God, and they give expression to that. God causes holy scripture to be written by people whose experience of the divine moves them to give expression to what that experience has been like. And over the course of time, the stories that continue to be carried forward 
are those stories which, which carry the divine and carry the human and offer guidance and grace for meaning and love in life. So that when it comes to scripture, when it comes to the story, it's all about hearing the story, telling the story, and becoming the story. That's what religion is all about. The belief in ultimate value and the practice that results in the experience of embracing what those ultimate values are. So that the story, scripture, is at the heart of exploring and discovering what it means to be human. And I'm going to repeat that statement and add another gerund. Scripture is at the heart of exploring and discovering, but also embodying what it means to be human. In John's gospel, the word becomes flesh and dwells among us. And we revere that in Jesus Christ. But the activity and process of hearing, telling, and becoming that story has our flesh and blood becoming the word. And the word of scripture so fills us. So it is, there's this process which, which culminates in that inward digestion of God's word such that we are nourished by it in ways that have us embodying what that word, what that meaning, what that ultimate value is. Scripture is at the heart of exploring and discovering and embodying what it means to be human, believing that being human means being related with ultimate value, with the divine. So that, that would be the why of scripture study. And in a moment, I'm going to go on to some of the hows of scripture study. But before I do that, are there any questions or comments on any of that? If I'm hearing you correctly, I think that God speaks to us through other people to help us and through the Holy Spirit, which is the, another form, of course, he helps us to help other people. But if you don't know your scripture, you won't be able to discern if you're saying and doing the right thing. So if you understand your scripture better, you will know when God is talking to you instead of that other one on the other shoulder. And you'll be able to help yourself more, be closer to God and allow God to come through you to help other people and vice versa. Other people that help, try to help you, you can tell when their help is coming from a good place. And to me, that good place is everything that we've learned through our scripture and God. But if we don't know it, we're not going to recognize it when we hear it. Does that make any sense? It does. It makes sense to me. I, I would add in there that I, by knowing scripture, one of some of the things we come to know is that uh, we're in it together. Mm. Who am I is paired with who are you? And then the third question is, where are we and what are we going to do about it? They're very basic questions, but they are the questions of meaning and, and love in life. And scripture isn't 
an imposition of do's and don'ts. It is a liberating dynamic for putting pieces, being a part of God's work of putting pieces back together again. And, uh, you know, Herb spoke about how uh, through history, so many have abused scripture as their justification for violent or hostile acts. And I, I remember years ago reading an, an essay called the, Vi the, the Bible is a dangerous violin. You can, you can make a case for anything and say the Bible says so, I, which is why we have to test things in community, which is what the church at its best has done through the ages. It, it takes a stand on something, first having said to each other, okay, does this hold water? Does this, does, does this do justice to people and give glory to God? And as Sue was saying, you know, if I know my scripture, then I can have a sense of what I'm thinking is, is, is right-minded. You still take that right-mindedness and you, you say with people you, you trust, I, I'm on the right track, right? In one fashion or another. And that's, that's the way scripture study should work. That it, in the end, as I said, is a communitarian uh, endeavor. Being the church is a communitarian endeavor. Father well, Tom, there was a comment that came in from Gloria. Gloria joined us late, so she's been a bit shy, but she posted something in chat. She says, I was late and just listening, but as a teacher, I note that many people don't know how to read and write because they don't have access to education. That doesn't mean that they can and don't have a relationship with scripture, but it makes me wonder. That's that's all from Gloria, yeah. right through to it makes me wonder. Yeah, yeah you, you don't have to know how to read and write to have uh, an interaction with scripture. In fact, stained glass windows in churches in their origin are about people not knowing how to read and write and the pictures tell the story. So in a way that uh, even folks who can't quote, read and write text uh, are capable of reading and communicating about the signs of the times and the presence of God in their life in one fashion or another, which you know, on another day, on another topic would get us into, okay, there is what we call holy scripture for us christians but there's lots of other sacred texts for other groups uh, are they not inspired i that's something to be thinking about because within our own cultural tradition we're very quick to say that artistic expressions musical compositions uh, can be uh, expressions of what scripture is is all about so i i guess that's starting to become a long-winded response to gloria's question that yes not being able to read and write is not a, a bar to having it the experience of god or first-hand experience of what scripture is trying to tell us I, but again, it, it, it helps. And then you're getting into a whole justice question about how do you help people to read and write? But that again is kind of a sidebar on this. Anything else about the why of studying scripture before I get a little bit in our 15 remaining minutes to the hows of studying scripture? Okay, so here are some suggested hows. And Kathy, I think, gave the lead one. Attending and participating in worship, being present to hearing scripture proclaimed, 
you know, and hearing the telling of it and listening to the proclamation and its explication or interpretation. That's, that's certainly sort of front and foremost in terms of people who participate in a Sunday liturgy. That's, I, uh, that's one way to study scripture. Some might say, well, if I was going to make a joke about it, I'd say that's a pretty passive way, but it's not passive. It's you are engaged liturgically in that moment. But if you want to get your feet wetter, you might read those upcoming Sunday lessons ahead of time so that you're familiar with the text rather than hearing it for the first time on Sunday morning. And then if you're not going to limit yourself to the Sunday readings, perhaps you could read something like forward day by day on a daily basis, which Dan's holding one up there and no, we didn't rehearse this. Uh, and they're available every three months or so in the back of the church. Uh, and it puts you in the practice of engaging scripture on a daily basis. Something else you could do is go to episcopalchurch.org slash Bible study. And you can follow the Sunday readings and also engage with the questions that those preset study guides are giving. So this would be always of opening up some more, which is all towards diving in to scripture. When I was nine years old, I did not dive into scripture, but my aunt and uncle belonged to a beach club on the ocean, and I was fascinated by the pool with its diving board, which to me, my memory of it is that it was an Olympic diving board way up, way up. And I would kind of inch my way up the ladder and then inch my way down. It took me a few times to even get all the way up the ladder. And this was over a few days. I finally get up onto the diving board and I look down at the water and I see the surface of the water. and it just scared me, but I was so fascinated by the water, I still wanted to dive in. And I finally talked myself into diving in, which was probably one of the, the first challenges that I can recall and saying, okay, I did it. And I dove in. And what I'm getting at here is that in a way, this is like studying the Bible. If you're going to study scripture, you're going to have to dive in. What you see from the surface isn't even really the picture. What you can read of scripture from the surface of your own experience is very important. But it's, it's not going to be enough because a lot of what you see from the surface of scripture, like from the surface, you're up there on the diving platform, what you see of the surface of the water is a reflection of the sky. Same thing with scripture. If you look at it from the surface, you're really going to get a reflection of your, your own ups and downs at the moment and not necessarily the richness of what the text has to offer. So you have to dive in and break the surface of the text. And you've got to go all the way down to the bottom of the pool. And down there at the bottom of the pool, what you're dealing with is when it comes to this scriptural passage, and let's just say we're looking at a gospel text, what might Jesus' original audience have understood by what he's saying or doing in that passage? And my point here is that's a question you need to ask before what do you think about this passage? Is what might the original hearers, what might their situation in life have been that uh, Jesus is addressing them in this way? And there you are at the bottom of the pool asking yourself those kinds of questions. And then you start to come 
back up and maybe you're halfway back up. And at this point, the question is, what has the church taught about this passage or the concepts in this passage through the centuries? So you're starting to come back up through the water with the beginnings of an appreciation of what the original meaning might have been, how the church appropriated the text and taught about it over time. And then as you come back up and break the surface and come up for air, you're, you're benefiting from that deep dive because now you come up and you're, you're all wet with scripture. You're not looking at it objectively but you're experiencing it a bit more subjectively, even though you've asked the objective questions, what was the original meaning of the text? How has the church taught about this throughout history? Then you're in a better position to say, what does this text mean to me? Now, it still might mean the same thing it meant to you when you were looking at it from the top of the diving board, but your deep dive might also have given you sort of collateral appreciation of a number of ways to look at that passage so that you have a richer appreciation of it. And when you do come up and break the surface, you can say, okay, what does this text say to me? And then you can look around and say, what might this passage be? Uh, instructing us, or how might we apply it to what's going on in the world today? And it it just it's an enriched dive into scripture. I'll stop there for a second. Anybody have anything they want to offer this poor this poor nine year old? Very um, very perceptive of the nine year old. And interesting how um, something that occurred so much long ago, so long ago, you know, could become a teaching tool much later in life. Yeah. And much like the stories that Jesus told in the parables, you, know, you take something very complex and the interaction, you know, between uh, what the original meaning and, um, and the, uh, what the church has taught and what does it mean to me today? You know, Sue and I knew Father Kevin very well. He was the one who married us. And Father Kevin always gave very brief sermons. And they were always very effective. What he basically said, he, and I said, Kevin, and one time I, I taped all the sermons for him and gave them a collection of these up to like six months. And he said, oh, I said, you know, how does he do it? He said, well, it's real simple. What I do is, you know, what was, what was, what was happening at the time? Uh, what is the, um, what was Jesus trying to say? And what does it have to do with me today? That was it. So your, your pool analogy reminded me of that. Good, good. One thing I just keep hammering at is even when you take that deep dive in studying scripture, you still have to test it out with others. The study of scripture is a community endeavor. St. Jerome, who died in 420 AD, so he hasn't been around for a while, and he died in Bethlehem. St. Jerome was the first person to translate the Bible into the language of the people, Latin. And that's his, his edition of the Bible is called the Latin Vulgate uh, in the vernacular, in the language of the people. But Vulgate comes from that word vulgar, common tongue, which reminds us that scripture is not a far off untouchable text in some sort of esoteric sacred language. Scripture is here and near. It's holy, not because of some special sacred language, but because it can be the occasion of interaction between humans with the divine. And it's available to everybody. And Jerome underlined the importance of this and the importance of group study because he had a, a regular Bible study group, which he called the Bethlehem community. And, I, and basically he was saying, I, you know, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but if we're going to give birth to the church, we've, we've got to meet together because the Holy Spirit moves between the people. And as I said before, inspiration is not imposed from above. 
So I've given you some things about the why of studying scripture and a few hows to study scripture. Let me just throw you a few more comments that you can take or leave. But I, depending on the Bible you use to study scripture, it, it would be a good idea to have a Bible that's a study edition. And the most tested and true English translation of the Bible right now is the new revised standard version, NRSV. It's the version we use in church on Sundays. So uh, if you don't have a Bible and you're in the market for one, I would recommend a study edition of the new revised standard version. And then I would also point out there are a number of Bibles, especially if you, you know, you look online or you go into a Barnes and Noble, so many of the Bibles are, are in a way not really Bibles, they're interpretations of the Bible. And there, there's one edition called the NIV, the New International Version. And it's it's not a translation of scripture, it, it's an interpretation. It's like putting it's sermonizing scripture, but it's sitting there as if it were the scripture. And that's, that's, it's, it's, that's not good. And the other thing I would suggest is beware of the internet. But you already know that about so many things. But truly beware of the internet. You've got to know that you've got a credible source if you're going to go to the internet for biblical interpretation. And it's one of the reasons I suggested episcopalchurch.org, not because I think the Episcopal Church is the beginning and end of everything, but you're going to get credible source material there. And if you were to read, if, if what you were interested in is reading a whole book of the Bible, rather than like the Sunday snippets, and you were to say, Tom, where, where would I begin? My recommendation for Gospels is begin with Mark. Read Mark's Gospel. You can read it in a sitting. Read Mark's Gospel. Why? Because I said so. Why? Because it, it moves fast. And it, it starts with the adult Jesus, which is where the gospel really starts. If it weren't for the adult Jesus, there wouldn't be a story about Christmas. So uh, Mark's gospel starts with the adult Jesus. It's in a way, it's the origin story for the gospel. For the Old Testament, which in two sessions down the road, I'll say, let's not ever call it the Old Testament again. But in the Hebrew scripture, the place to start the origin story is the book of Exodus. You would start with the Exodus event. And I'll, I'll say more about that in the future. Uh, when we get together next time and we're looking at, you know, what's, what's good in the Gospels or what are the Gospels good for? Uh, in that and in the one in November on the Hebrew Bible, I'm just going to, I'm going to do like an overview of key concepts and key dynamics in the New Testament and key dynamics in the Hebrew Bible. And then once we've gotten through November, you all might say, okay, can we next study such and such when it comes to scripture? So these are just really kind of general overviews that uh, I invite you to continue to participate in and to have whatever questions and comments that come to mind. And I've eaten up all our time except for a minute and 30 seconds. I, but quickly, if you came with a favorite scripture passage tonight, could you just share that as we sign off for the evening? Sue? Mine is real short. It's Matthew 7, 7, 8. It's also my favorite hymn, number 711. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. 
Knock and the door will be open to you for everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be open. That's my favorite one. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else with a favorite? I got one. Um, and it's a tough one, but you talked about scripture, you know, embodying the story. Um, and it's Jesus uh, on the cross in Luke chapter 7, 23 to 24. Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. And if ever I try to get people to reconcile and get someone to forgive their brother or their sister, I said, mm -hmm. you, say, you, you say that you're a Christian, you say you believe all this stuff. If Jesus is willing to do that on the cross to the people who crucified him, tell me that you, you're not willing to, to, to forgive someone who hurt you. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Kathy? I'm going to read something really beautiful. It says, Yeshua said, I am the light that shines on everyone. I am the all. The all came forth from me, and the all came into me. Split the wood, and I am there. Turn over the stone, and there you will find me. And that's from Thomas, the apostle. Okay. Put his finger in the wound and doubted, needed proof. He wanted to have his own proof that Jesus rose again. Thank you. Anyone else? Sharon? Yeah, I, um, well, for me, one of the most powerful uh, is very short, and it is that Jesus wept. For me, that encompasses such compassion, such love, such humanity that I get teary when I think of it. It is just so all-encompassing. Jesus wept. Uh, yes. Thank you. Herb. I'll try to redeem myself because Gretchen asked me before, what's your favorite Bible verse? And I was lost. Um, but <laughs> on reflection, and I wish I could quote this, you know, the scripture, but then again, I looked it up so I can. Um, I'm, I'm cheating um, in that way, but it's Mark uh, 12, 17. But uh, in general, I, and I think it's a principle to always keep in mind where Jesus says, uh, render unto Caesar what is Caesar and render unto God what is God. And I think that it's so easy to, I, I always use the expression with my kids um, to sell your soul for a pot of gold, you know, to pursue something um, and not really reflect on what is important and what you should be um, devoted to and doing so um but i i use the phrase don't sell your soul for a pot of gold and i think mm -hmm. what what jesus in that sense was saying keep in mind what god, what does god keep that in your forefront all the time good. see i i had something there good work even if your head takes up the whole screen <laughs> <laughs> it's called a mona's head <laughs> We got another one from Gloria. Gloria said, Gloria said, let the little children come unto me. Yes. Okay, anyone else? And not to ruin those scripture passages for anybody, but be giving some thought to, okay, what would original hearers of that passage understood? way back when what has the church taught about that and what does it mean to me and again it may not change what it means for you but can it could enrich your understanding of the passage sometimes it's what originally was going on is something we don't know about and you've you've got to let the scholars tell you about it and it can kind of turn you upside down uh, like that passage from Micah, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Micah is basically yelling at the people saying, hold on a second. Yes, you've strayed. Israel has strayed. But at that time, at the time of Micah, they're still debating whether animal sacrifice makes God feel better. 
should human sacrifice be reinstituted? If I gave up my firstborn, would that, would that, you know, redeem me in God's eyes? And Micah is saying, wait a second, I can't believe this debate is going in this direction. What has the Lord always required of you but to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly? And when you hear the context of the original words, it, it sounds not so much like a way back then ancient situation as a very modern contemporary one. And on that note, I thank you all for being here this evening. And I know I'll see many of you on Sunday. And I look forward to your being back in October when we talk about what is the gospel good for. Until then, peace be with you. Thank you.